Should I begin? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, um, Daniel, maybe you shut down your microphone. There are a lot of uh, people. Sorry. Ah, much better. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. I'm never sure. I never really believe it was Zoom, but I'll take your word for it. Um, it's a pleasure to be at this conference. It's a pleasure to be at this conference. Um, should I speak for 30 minutes? Is that correct? Um, yeah. Okay, good. That's what I will do. So um, it's 1036 now, so I'll speak in Chicago. So I'll speak till six minutes after the hour. Is that right? Okay, good. Just tell me if I'm, I'm, I'm going on for too long, please. Um, thank you very much. So my talk um, will be on the sign symbol distinction in the Tractatus. I confess that um, I have found this a very difficult distinction to understand. i um, been struggling with it all my life. Um, the tendency for many years um, was to treat the sign symbol distinction as if it were perfectly straightforward distinction of a sort that analytic philosophers are familiar with. Something like the distinction between syntax and semantics, where signs are thought to be something like uninterpreted marks, or noises and symbols are thought to be something like meanings in the analytic philosopher's sense, propositions or something like that. So that um, um, the identity of a symbol, it's having a particular meaning, does not depend upon its linguistic expression in any way. and. Um, a sign, or what it is to be a sign, is for something to have a certain kind of perceptual shape that it could have, whether it's part of a language or not. And so its identity does not depend um, on the symbol um, or language in any way, at least its initial identity, qua sign. Um, I think um, that's wrong. Um, I've been clear for some time now, and clear, um, and others have, that, that standard distinction, that standard reading of the symbol is wrong. But to really understand the passages about sign and symbol in the Tractatus, I think one needs to understand both halves of the distinction. And the part I found very hard to get clear about um, is the part about the sign. I think much of what I myself wrote before about this presupposes what we might call the standard conception of the sign. I should also say that this misunderstanding of Wittgenstein, the sign symbol distinction, especially this misunderstanding of already early Wittgenstein's conception of the sign, I think, you know, what I'm saying here is in disagreement with almost all of the secondary literature. And that is to say it has no, makes no difference. It's neutral with respect to things like whether you're a resolute reader or an anti-resolute reader or an affability theorist or something, who knows what. Um, the points I'm making here, I think, are heterodox with respect to um, that entire body of literature, including my own, so much of my own early, early writing. I just say that because there's a tendency for every issue to get sort of sorted into a certain debate and then um, no new issue can come up because we're stuck on that debate. So I mean to be uh, not stuck in some debate like that, and at least for what I say here. Another reason I think this topic is interesting is because I think this is one issue, one point, one moment of clarity in the Tractatus about the sign symbol distinction, especially the half I'll talk about what a sign is, that's very important to later Wittgenstein, as much he criticizes in the Tractatus. I think there's a way in which one can see much of that criticism as being built on a thinking through um, his insight about the nature of the sign. So certain things I say here about what early Wittgenstein thinks about the nature of sign, I think is very helpful for understanding later Wittgenstein, and especially the rule following sections. Um, you can see this point as being something that, in a way, eats his entire early philosophy when he thinks it through. Um, so, um, so those are just some introductory remarks. There's a handout. Does everyone have a copy of the handout? Um, has that been distributed? The handout is charged on the chat, on the chat of Google Meet. You find it attached. Okay, you'll find the handout very helpful in a moment because it 
contains i don't know how to put it visual displays that i don't know how to communicate in words <laughs> so i need your eyes to be able to <coughs> look at the handout should i give everyone a moment to get it so does anyone have the handout now i see some nodding heads okay well so i'm hoping that um um, you manage and finds its way to you. Um, I, the reason I thought I would just, you don't need it that much. And so I don't think it needs to take up the screen. And then you can go back and look at things on it if you want. It also contains some things I won't get to in the talk or I'll just mention. And so we can use them in discussion if you want. And so it'd be distracting in a way to have them on the screen. But the first thing you have on the handout is an attempt. It's actually just a quotation from an earlier paper of mine. I could have quit, quoted lots of people. Um, the point um, here isn't that um, Conan um, has had made some interesting mistake. I think what he says here is quite typical. I just thought I might as well criticize myself in that case. Um, so here's how Conan, um, in an earlier paper, tries to explain the distinction between um, sign and symbol in the Tractatus, or um, between Zeichen and Symbol. What I say about a symbol, I think, you know, is almost a paraphrase of the Tractatus. And you know, what said what I say there is okay, I think. I say a symbol is a logical unit. It's something that meaningful propositions have in common. <coughs> and what I want to focus on at the moment is what I say about a sign. <coughs> now the first half of what I say about a sign, I think there um, before the parentheses can't quite be wrong either because it's more or less a direct paraphrase of the Tractatus. The question is, what does it mean? He says, um, well, actually, I think there is something. Well, I say it's an orthographic unit. The question is, what does that mean? Um, but it's um, something that a perceptible expressions for propositions have in common. I think that's right. But what are perceptible expressions? Well, perceptible expressions for propositions, not of propositions, I say. I think that's already wrong. Um, and then I try, you know, because I think it's so obvious. I think Conan thinks this is so obvious. I think the point of the parentheses is to say something like, you know. And so then I say, a sign design, an inscription, an icon, a grapheme. Here are other words that other philosophers have used for what the Tractatus means by a sign. So, you know, the spirit of the person who's written this is, this idea, this is the part that's easy. We all know what a sign is. Different philosophers have different words for it. And the hard part is the symbol. And now today I'm going to say, no, I think the sign part is just as half hard as the symbol part. And we don't understand either unless we understand both. And um, everything in this parentheses is um, misleading at best and false at worst. Um, in this parenthetical gloss of what a sign is. Um, and um, so, you know, the most, on my most charitable view of my earlier self, I would still say that these parenthetical glosses I offer here of what a sign is show a ten, at least a tenuous grip on early Wittgenstein's conception of the sign. And I would say actually early or later Wittgenstein's conception of the sign. My first gloss is inscription. This is a word analytic philosophers often use when they want to tell you what they call a sign is um, and what think they're getting clear about it. Um, so let's start with that one and think a bit harder about it than um, I was thinking before. What does it mean in English um, today if I say something's an inscription? Or what does it mean when I say I inscribe something on something? Well, it can mean something like to write or carve letters on something. Where letters are understood to um, belong to some form of writing or notation. And the idea is I could teach you what that is. I could teach you that notation um, before um, you knew what anything meant. Or it could even just mean to carve or engrave or etch or cut or otherwise cause a series of mere shapes to appear on some surface or medium like stone or paper or wood. Um, 
mere shapes that might be taken to resemble the shapes of, say, in one of our languages, German or English or Italian, the letters of a phonetic alphabet, where the so-called letters are now qua the shapes they are to be regarded as nothing more than mere scratches or marks. So now we come to the second example in the handout. Imagine while working my way from left to right, as I find it natural to do, um, I want to incise or um, some decorative patterns. I say incise the following pair of decorative patterns on the wall of my living room. <laughs> um, um, the two decorative patterns I put in my living room, you see on the next item in the handout. That's what they look like. Um, and to my surprise, it looks to a friend of mine who's a native speaker of Arabic as if the lower of those two patterns belongs to a different order than the higher. And also another interesting fact about my friend is that when he looks at that lower pattern, he scans it as it were from right to left, the opposite direction from the one I drew it, just drawing a pattern as I thought of it. Or um, if this example is confusing, uh, to give you the same example um, in a way that might be somewhat easier for us to deploy um, who know English, um, imagine that a native speaker, one who knows no English, wants to decorate his living room, and he um, incises a pair of patterns onto a surface that looks to me, a native speaker of English, as if the lower of the two belongs to a different order of pattern the other. And so scanning now from left to right, the opposite direction from which he draws it, I look at the second pattern and it seems to me to say in English, God is great. It seems to contain words, not just decorations. Um, now, I'm going to call the following the mere sequence of marks conception of the sign. According to the mere sequence of Marx's conception of the sign, a quote sign, unquote, is that which figures as the highest common factor across the following two ways of characterizing one of these lower, one of these second, one of the, the second of one of these two patterns. So it's the highest common factor across one, the marks that constitute the design sequence that the decorator merely inscribes in his wall, and two, the marks that constitute an expression of the sentence that a native speaker of the language understands and effortlessly reads a certain way, in a certain direction, by the way. It's not clear when you look at a decorative pattern, there is a correct direction for scanning it. But if you're reading a sentence of the language, you have to read it in the right direction. Um, so the mere marks conception or the mere sequence of Marx's conception says there's what I'm calling a highest common factor across these two cases. And I want to contrast that with what I will, what I take to be the Tractarian conception of the sign, which for the moment I will just, I, for the moment I'll call this the essentially linguistic conception of the sign. And I will just state what it holds negatively or primitively for a moment. On the essentially linguistic conception of the sign, there is no such highest common factor. So, on the first of these conceptions, the logically simpler and more fundamental case is that of the sign. The nature of the symbol is to be explained through enhancing our prior conception of the sign. It is, we might say, the sign plus something. The sign used, philosophers often say, in accordance with certain rules. Assuming that the pattern inscribed by the inscriber and anecdote does not belong to some standardized repertoire of decorative patterns, as it has to be to put it on a font and print it out on a handout, but say I was actually just drawing, you know, with a paint stick. Um, but it's so it's a pattern that the decorator takes himself to invent it on his own in decorating the wall. Then it looks as if we ought to say on this standard conception of the sign, if we state it as literally as I just did, 
that the sign is constituted by nothing more than mere marks. But that would mean that any variation, the shape or size of the pattern would automatically bring about some, perhaps very small, change in the sign. Because the sign is nothing but its visual appearance qua mark. If we alter it anyway, then we have a new sign or sequence of signs. So in this conception of the sign, mere qua description, what we might call the hyperliteral understanding of the mere marks conception, a sign is just a particular object with a determinate set of physically characterizable properties. And on that literal version of that conception, notice it's not clear what it would be for a sign to repeat. There are no principles for determining what counts as the repetition of a sign or for determining even where one sign leaves off and the next begins, or even for what counts as merely belonging to the background on which signs are ascribed as opposed to belonging to the signs themselves. <coughs> if you can, so I don't know if you're all sitting at a desk or something, you know, maybe look at your desk or if you have a carpet next to you, look at your carpet. My desk is made out of wood. So there's lots of shapes on the surface of my desk that just come from the grain of my wood, lots of patterns. Now, if I ask myself, how many distinct signs or patterns of signs are there in the wood on the surface of my desk? I don't know. It's not that I can't make up some way of answering that question, <clears throat> but there is no sense in which, apart from the introduction of some arbitrary stipulations, the question, how many signs are there in the surface of my desk? How many patterns of marks are there? Has any correct answer or clear sense? One reason the question as posed has no correct answer is we, I have no clear principle for determining where one sign ends and the next starts, or more importantly, what counts as the recurrence in some particular shape so that I can see it as a recurrence of the same sign. What this helps to bring out is that the concept of a linguistic sign already must partake of a form of generality that a mere mark or pattern of incision or inscription does not. In learning a language or a form of notation, one of the things you learn is what counts as a significant repetition, a genuine repetition of the sign. And actually you learn a great deal more. You learn answers to questions like, what belongs to the signs themselves and what belongs to the space in which they occur or inscribed or expressed? What constitutes the end of one sequence and the beginning of another? And therefore also, what sorts of marks or arrangements or intervening microspaces punctuate <coughs> or otherwise serve to structure a sequence? <coughs> so there could think, be things like a period or a comma or a parenthesis or a longer space, which tells you you have a new thought or sentence thing. So the absence of a sign in a system of notation is also a form of sign within the notation. More subtly still, <coughs> I say that the notion of a sign <coughs> partakes of a certain form of generality. One of the things already I think the Tractatus holds, and it's very important until even later Wittgenstein, is the nature of this generality is not conceptual generality. That part of what we need to understand, understand what a sign is, is what sort of apprehension of generality, the apprehension of the recurrence of a sign is. And that this is fundamental to language. Now, all of the problems I just mentioned have tended to seem to analytic philosophers, including readers of Wittgenstein, to be, I think, much easier to solve than they really are. And this increasingly becomes a central point of Wittgenstein's philosophy, starting already with the Tractatus. On a less literal version of what I was calling the mere Marx conception, one according to which perhaps shape matters but precise size does not matter to the identity of an inscription. You could make room for a certain rudimentary idea of what might constitute a principal degree of insignificance in variation in the appearance. And hence, you might think you could start to make sense of what counts as a repetition of the sign. So on the next thing in your handout, you have you know, something that might be a merely decorative pattern, but could also, you know, on this conception, be some words of Arabic, 
um, occurring three times. Um, <clears throat> but because the size is changing, that doesn't mean the shape is changing. Or we could say the same thing about the next thing in the handout, where it's clearly just a decorative pattern. We could say they're the same signs, even though the size is changing. Because there's something we take ourselves to be individuating merely geometrically. We call this the geometric conception of the version of the mere Marx conception. But that's not going to yield us with the resources we need to account for any interesting notion of repetition of a sign. Notice it doesn't even account for the next thing on the handout. The three cases, they're written in very different kinds of fonts, even on just my computer. Um, we're not gonna be able to see what makes those cases of the same letters. Why all the R's, the second letter in great, is the same letter on a merely geometrical conception. And this is gonna be even clearer if we revert to human handwriting. In my handwriting, Every time I write an A or an O, it varies in how open or closed it is. And if you can't see it properly in connection with other signs, you're not gonna know what sign it is. Some of my O's look more like my U's. Some look more like my A's. Um, appeals to supposedly merely outward forms of resemblance or shared geometric properties will not do the trick. The Tractatus teaches us, I submit, that a coherent conception of the unity of the sign across the cases of its occurrence in a language requires a conception of sign that allows us to recognize, for instance, in my last item in the handout, the three expressions of God is great, those three expressions to be expressions of the same propositional symbol. So you master the unity of the sign by being able to see the symbol and the sign. And through mastering unity of symbol, you master unity of sign. This is a condition of being able to apprehend genuine occurrences of the sign. Once you have that capacity, once you've, once you've mastered a notation, you can use it for other purposes. Wittgenstein will have room for the idea of a mere sign. But the idea that, but what a mere sign is, is something that has real possibilities of symbolizing that you have mastered that is not symbolizing in that way in that context. That is, the idea of a mere sign is parasitic logically on the idea of a sign in use. The other way around from the standard conception, where first you have the sign, and then the idea of the meaningful sign is the interpreted sign, the sign plus its use. So, on the Tractatus's conception, this is to reject that the logically simpler, simpler and more fundamental case is that of the sign. And then what a symbol is can be explained on an appropriately supplemented conception of the sign. As I put it a moment ago, the sign plus something. That's the idea that's being criticized throughout Wittgenstein's work, starting already with the Tractatus. Rather the sign in the logically fundamental case of its mode of occurrence is an internal aspect of the symbol. The sign is an internal aspect of the symbol. The next thing on my handout is the passage in the Tractatus, which I am trying to talk about for 30 minutes and explain. The Tractatus says, the sign is, well, this is actually very hard to translate. He says of the Zeichen that it is das sinnlich wahrnehmbar am Symbol. So how do we translate this, especially that am? Um, the sign is that on the symbol, or a little less awkwardly in English, that in the symbol, which is perceptible by the senses. To get out the thought here, this is not a literal translation, we might also translate it like this. The sign is the aspect of the symbol, which is perceptible by the sense. It's the sensibly apprehensible aspect of the symbol. That's what the sign is. Professor Conrad, 10 yes. minutes remaining. Very good. Yeah, I have my eye on it. Okay, 10 minutes. Perfectly. Oh, that's a little more than I thought. Thank you. <laughs> Take the extra four minutes. <laughs> um, um, conversely, what this means is that it's essential to a symbol. To what a symbol is, this is one half of the point, that it have an essentially perceptible aspect. 
The sign is its perceptibly as perceptual aspect, and what a symbol is for the truck daughter is something you can perceive across expressions. As I understand the Tractatus, there is no privileged direction of explanatory priority between symbol and sign. Without signs, there are no symbols. We could put this rather misleading in the, in the analytic philosopher's parlance by saying, without language, there is no thought, but that could be misunderstood. And without some sort of relation to symbols, there are no signs. Hence, the philosopher's concept, the standard philosopher's concept of the supposedly merely linguistic actually tacitly trades and presupposes an internal relation to symbols. But also these two forms of dependence, the dependence of the symbol and the sign and that of the sign and the symbol are not of the same sort. They're forms of dependence in different logical dimensions that work differently. And the one this talk is about that I found very hard to understand is the character of the logical dependence of the sign on the symbol. So Wittgenstein does not seek to invert the order of explanation with which the mere sequence of Marx's conception works. It's not just saying it's backwards, it's the other way around. Rather, he seeks to bring out how it's essential to our understanding of the logically fundamental case of the occurrence of the sign that we recognize it as a logically internal aspect of a symbol. This requires that the sign partake <coughs> of its own form of repeatability or generality, one that is distinct from the symbol, but that depends on the generality of the symbol. Wherever we can rec recognize a recurrence of the same symbol, there is the possibility of a sensibly apprehensible mode of expression that involves the same signs, <coughs> as in my three examples of God is great. The concept of the sign here required is one of something whose identity may be retained across extraordinary variation in the shape, size, font, style, etc. of the sign, as in my handwriting. Now, you can try to teach machines to recognize whenever I am writing the same sign. But what the computer has to do, what such a symbol or a sign recognition system has to do, is something very, very different and parasitic upon the programmer's understanding of what a sign is. It is not an ordinary task of merely sensible recognition. It is a form of exercise of our perceptual capacity that is dependent on, subordinate of, and an aspect of our linguistic capacity is a form of linguistic perception, logical perception, we could say, to bring out this difficult idea in the Tractatus. So when we have difficulty reading my handwriting, when you have difficulty reading my handwriting, you're not mastering some bizarre new notational system that involves 26 different what analytic philosophers would call tokens for the letters of my written alphabet. Rather, in the logically basic case of the exercise of your capacity for this form of linguistic apprehension, you are apprehending the identity of these signs that you already are familiar with in their occurrence in my writing through recognizing the symbol in them. And that is the basic case in which you do it. By seeing what I'm writing means, you also see what it's, the sign is. And if there's a moment of clarity, partly by working through the identity of symbol, you establish the identity of sign. It's not the only way it goes, but that's the logically fundamental way it goes. That's the way it goes to acquire mastery of the sign in the first place. So what Wittgenstein will mean by an expression such as mere sign, or if we're talking about later Wittgenstein, more famously dead sign, is something he seeks to show has the wrong sort of logical generality or repeatability to be a highest common factor across two cases. One of which is a case of something that is internal to the order of the symbol. And one of which is not. And in fact, in a certain way, isn't even language yet. That conception of a highest common factor he wants to show us is a confusion. Something that is recognizable as a mere sign in the Tractarian sense 
involves a logically defective or attenuated exercise of our capacity to employ signs in the recognition of symbols. It's a capacity is very possibility, the capacity to see something as a mere sign that presupposes the prior capacity to employ it and to recognize it as the sensibly perceptible aspect of a symbol. So most contemporary philosophers will, if I explain the Tractarian conception, take it to involve an inverted order of explanation. They think they have something, though I'm arguing here they have something much more confused. They think what they'll be doing is saying the order of explanation is the other way around. They will be taking what Wittgenstein thinks is the problematic or derivative mode of occurrence as the logically simpler phenomena, the mere sign. And what for Wittgenstein is the comparatively logically less problematic case as being the logically complex case that involves something being added to the sign. Um, something that, to borrow a phrase from later Wittgenstein, breathes life into a dead sign, breathes life into something that is otherwise necessarily semantically inert. I'll give you a little example to bring out this point. It comes from um, teaching English in Japan. So it's the next thing in your handout. I'm an English teacher. My students have all, my Japanese students have all studied English for at least a decade. They're fairly adept at reading, but not at all adept. This is a very realistic example, I might tell you. Not at all adept at listening to or speaking English. Um, so they're neither able to follow a simple conversation between native speakers, nor able to say something that a native speaker such as myself can straight off recognize as English. When they speak to me in English, I don't even realize they're speaking English. Um, and so this teacher realizes he has no chance of teaching them to speak the relevant sounds, as the analytic philosopher would call it, of English until they first acquired the ability to hear those sounds. So the teacher has developed a technique. This is a technique I actually developed when I was teaching English as a teenager in Japan. So I write the following four English words on the blackboard. There they are, you can see them. I've numbered them one, two, three, four. Roll, roar, lull, lore. Four English words, they're distinct. A native English speaker can hear, they are, they are phonemic distinctions. And the exercise is this, I say one of the words, and then I ask the students, is that number one, number two, number three, number four? And when I start this exercise, 25%, whichever one I say, say I say, lull, 25% of the students think it's number one, 25% think it's number two, 25% think it's number three, 25% think it's number four. I alternate that exercise with other exercises, like I show them what I'm doing with my tongue when I say the L rather than the R. I get them to learn to do this with their tongue without biting it while they're speaking, which actually turns out to be quite difficult for some of them. Um, I show them the difference between having the tongue rest against the back of the upper teeth briefly and having it approach the teeth without touching them when one says the R. And I ask them to attend to the position of their tongue as they say these things and as they listen to me, then I return to the exercise of saying either number one, number two, number three, number four. Thank you, Yuki, for your, um, your um, testimony about this example. <laughs> um, and about after an hour or so, I notice their votes start to change so that a few more, 30, 35, 40% are guessing or maybe not even guessing the right answer. So what I'm teaching these students to do is to discern four distinct phonemic English signs out of an acoustic space in which they are initially unable to do this, out of which they are initially able to discern only phonemes, which they themselves are able to produce. The only acoustic signs they can initially recognize are ones that are internally related to symbols they can produce. Now, um, I, I'll, yes, I'll just end now. There's much more I could say about that example. But what I want to bring out is that the acoustic sign there, I think it's easier to see this point with respect to the acoustic sign because we have regimented print now, which can lead to fantasies 
about what is involved. We have mechanized print that leads to fantasies about what's involved in recognizing the written sign. So I start with the acoustic case here. But what I want to bring out is that to those students, it's not that they hear the difference between those four words, but they think, but they make the wrong assignments of meaning. It's not that they hear the marks and noises, but all of Davidson or Quine, they don't know how to interpret them. They literally cannot hear the differences. That is, there is no space in which to see a rep repetition of the sign. And the thing that needs to repeat, the character of its repeatability, so you can hear it in different accents, and the difference between the Australian and the American speaker of English is not the kind of repetition that can be acquired, except, so this is very clear in linguistics, the notion of a phony is the difference in the sound structure of an acoustic sign that can make a difference to the meaning. The legitimate variation in the sign is the degree of variation within a phonological space that could make a real difference to meaning. So even the modern linguist, not always the analytic philosopher, in his difference between phonetics and phonemics, realizes an internal relation between the linguistic sign and what the Tractatus is calling the symbol. That's the beginning of starting to see that what, what it is to be able to see the difference requires seeing the sign as internally related to and an aspect of the symbol. Now, once one's mastered a phonological space, one can use signs apart from the initial symbols through which one acquired them. And even little children, even when they only know a few words of English, can learn to become what are called canonical babblers of English. And when English children learn to babble, as opposed to Italian children, as opposed to Ch Chinese or Japanese children learn to babble, they're learning to become canonical babblers in the science system of the different language. But one way of bringing out the point here is that what is involved in learning to become a canonical babbler of a language is a far more sophisticated linguistic capacity than the analytic philosopher imagines. And it's internally related and, to ex and an exercise of the same linguistic power. It's an internal aspect of the same capacity or power as learning to discern symbols in that okay. language. Okay. So that's that's the talk. The rest of the handout involves especially things that bring out the connection between this idea and the Tractatus and later Wittgenstein, the investigations. If people are interested in what I was saying is the connection here. Obviously, this idea is developed much more deeply in later Wittgenstein, but it has its origin here in the Tractatus.